Okay, welcome back. Alright, we're gonna start where we left off. This is, uh, will be part 7 of uh, our uh, playthrough of World in Economica, uh, episode 1. Alright, let's see what happens next in the story. The moon had low gravity, so it was common to utilize a spring when doing any weight training. A rod and coil made for that purpose had been sold online and was a rather popular product. However, it was questionable how many who bought it actually used it. After all, the fitness company who made a fortune selling sets of rods and coils had managed to sell over 3 million sets including similar items, but no matter how you looked at it, any single set would have been more than sufficient. In fact, the population on the moon was about 700,000 people, although tourists would send their number up to 1 million. There were many people out there who would buy it and not use it, knowing that a new model was on the way. Then why would they buy it? They would buy it, not use it, knowing that a new model would be on the way. Just seems like they're just buying it. They might need it? I don't know. In my opinion, it seems kind of stupid. Even if the equipment was used properly, there was the matter of using it for more difficult applications. And then, the user manual would neglect to note this. The words of my stubborn old-fashioned father would repeat in my head while I did weight training. With weights on my arms, shoulders, back, and abs, I would do balance training, involving headstands and light somersaults, which would go on for no more than 20 minutes. Since I wasn't aiming to be an athlete, any training beyond that wasn't really necessary. If nothing else, the people who came from the town my folks were from, the kind who could tell, who, who could never tell a lie, would all say in unison to, Take care of the body, for it will always be useful. With the height of net prosperity, and the lower gravity, and the near unlimited supply of electrical power on the moon, physical labor was categorized as being the lowest of the low in terms of recognition. Seems like they might have a lot of automated stuff if physical labor is not needed. But I guess that makes sense if you got a lot of electrical, electrical, you know, energy you don't have a low supply, so that means energy must be cheap then. There were any people who had made it big with physical labor. At best, there was always the consideration of those who worked in show business, but even then, the ones who got paid the big money weren't the actors who toiled away in their craft, but the people who managed them. I guess that kind of makes sense in a way. I mean, you think about who probably makes a lot of money in a lot of different energy, I industries. It's the people at the top. The people who are kind of governing the rest of it. Even though, arguably, sometimes they don't put in, put in as much work. And they're not really the ones who are the talent. They do see a, I would, I would assume, a pretty big cut. However... After leaving home and taking the time to observe things outside of the boundaries of the rules of society, I have come to understand that there are a lot of truth in those words. Even after invading the police sent to bring me back home, I realized that there was some useful advice to be had, as expected of those seasoned veterans who escaped from the jaws of guerrilla fighters, secret police, and military jutas. I wiped the sweat off with the towel and put on my clothes. The same clothes Lisa and Hagana were complaining about before. His smelly clothes? I think that's what they said. He kind of stunk or something. <clears throat> After two washes, I finally... Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> After two washes, I probably finally got rid of the smell. But I had a feeling that I had washed away something like an important mark of readiness that had been stained into the clothing in the last three months. The one thing I had become aware of after leaving home was that people were relaxed by the smell of detergent. The word cleanliness had a rather weak image. Then again, this wasn't half bad.
I stretched my back and tossed my backpack over my shoulder. Since today was Sunday and the trading houses were closed, it was an important day for me as I could go out and just walk around. It also appeared that the culprit from the thief was arrested, so the odds of being mistakenly arrested and taken home had diminished. It was just as Lisa suspected. The culprit was a young man who also ran away, run away from home, leaving home without any means, turned to a life of crime and causing trouble for others. This guy was clearly the typical idiot. It's possible that he wasn't from Earth, but was born and raised on the moon. As someone born and raised on the moon myself, I could sympathize. But for people from Earth, it seemed that the lower gravity was to blame for making many people lightheaded. Aside from issues of pride, many could live on the collected scraps left over from the genius and prodigies in Newton City who had amassed great fortunes. Some would say that it was all the fault of the sense of security, perhaps. Compared to the people who came to the moon from Earth, Within the group of tourists were also those who came with some great sense of purpose. They came to the moon to do something or another. It could be that it could be that they came to find a tranquil life they couldn't find back on Earth. Likewise, they might have come to find a thrilling life that couldn't be found back on Earth. After all, I understood that one must step forward when one had a purpose at hand. Anyway, the cost to take the orbital elevator by any legal means was staggering, and there were many hurdles to clear to where to look in discounts or exemptions. In any case, there were many Earth dogs who knew where they came from, where they were, and what they should be doing. Literally, there was Earth on the bottom of their shoes. <laughs> Literally, there was Earth on the bottom of their shoes. Are you saying they're taking Earth, like dirt, left over from Earth? Or are you trying to imply something else? <clears throat> that was why I hated those Earth dogs. These Earth dogs. But he apparently doesn't like them. I tied my shoes and left through the hallway. The place was eerily quiet. Lisa had headed out to the restaurant after eating breakfast. I knew that Hagana was still here, but outside of going to the toilet, she would seclude herself in her room and you couldn't even hear a peep coming out of there. I had no idea what she was doing in there, but I got eerie vibes. Yeah, what the hell is she doing in there? I mean, what kind of hobbies does she have? She's always secluded herself in there. Does she read, or does she do something else? I guess we might never know. That was why I, I had everything I owned in my backpack. I wouldn't be surprised if Hagana took a hammer to my PC and destroyed it while I was out. <laughs> you really... I don't know. I... I don't think she'd be that pissed at you, man. I, I, I understand that you guys have a bad relationship. And you got off on a bad start and continued to be on a bad start. But I don't think she would go out of her way to break into your stuff and smash your computer. I did not continue walking down the corridors toward the limerick room. Instead... I went up the stairs to the second floor. Oh, what's on the second floor? The church was in a low-income area, much like everything else around. It was built upon parts of a crater that had been partially zoned, so navigating the sector, sector was a bit complex. The entrance to the sector was along a relatively wide street, but the second and third floor portions seemed to cling to the cliffs as if they stretched upward. According to Lisa, these places were very well off financially. The faded parts of buildings here and there around the church were obvious, but they appeared neither small nor inexpensive. Ascending the narrow steps took you to two rooms that looked out of a small yard from which you could see the sky park. As they were both on a slant, the rooms themselves were small. One of them was apparently Lisa's. There was a white painted chair and table in the small garden. And if you were to ascend the stairs another level, they became more like a ladder. What functioned as a handrail was actually what Lisa used to carry a basket of laundry. There was a room, or rather, a storage shed, on the third floor. Past that you could reach a site near the roof. The door was wooden. There was a, there was a note on it, 
with a handwritten note from Lisa that said to always lock the door when leaving. I was sure people had been locked out many times. I, of course, would be returning through the front entrance, and with that I headed out. The moon was in the middle of a two-week-long afternoon, and the light that permeated the dome over this lunar city during this time felt rather good. Today, I could see Earth from the usual place. This yard had something of an extravagant feel to it with a large tree going very close to the cliff behind it. I wondered if the placement of the table and chair were so Lisa and Hagana could enjoy the shade of the tree. The cliffs all around gave the place a feeling of isolation. It was a nice place. Right now there was only the noise of a laundry machine, and it was clear that they what belonged to whom. Looking over the jumble of streets of the ninth outer sector, you could see someone on the roof casually reading something of a computer terminal, and someone repairing a roof. You could see bakeries and a dry cleaner buildings spewing out water vapor from mishapping chimneys and homes under construction. However, my objective wasn't to survey that area. It'd be nice to scale the cliff in the back and roam around the plateau above, but I'd probably end up on someone's property and they called the cops on me. I moved nimbly between the houses seen from the park and having found the continuation of the path towards the top of the plateau, broke into a run as I left the park. What was before me was what I had seen from the park. Before me were the buildings of Newton City that pointed in the direction of Earth. I left the six outer section business district, got on board the rather broadly named Lunar Development Train. It literally was a train from the time the lunar surface was being developed, the station's starting point and terminus. There was a diorama of an individual in a suit, space suit doing work in the lunar desert. No matter how much you could visit, if virtually on the net, tourists still flocked to the diorama as if it showing some difference of gratitude as they took pictures of it. Once. Someone had the bright idea of making an incision in it to accommodate a box, so tourists would make mistake it for a donation box. Supposedly, it was filled to the brim with coins. However, what the guy failed to realize was that after only a few hours, the foolish tourists would have filled the box with the donations. Then they would complain to the station attendant that they couldn't put any more in. Thus, the plan was foiled. After that, Capitalization on the idiot's bright idea, the station's attendants installed a large, unmarked box to collect small change from tourists. This was a classic example of a moment of carelessness toppling, even a good get-rich scheme. There wasn't a lot of living space on the moon, so the lunar development train almost seemed to apologize as it shrank down and sped through the city. The train passed alongside the chaotic mismatch of buildings, and for a brief moment, it was possible to look out the window to see into the lives of the people inside. The tourists looked great and took great amusement seeing their own country's culturally styled buildings and lifestyles. Of course, there were no cultural aspects I particularly saw that amused me at all. The moon was made up of a hodgepodge of immigrants. On top of that, it was a place for people who couldn't shake off Earth's gravity gathered, so the coloring was way too pale. That was why one could say that the line performed very well. Even those from my hometown who hoped to accomplish something would resolutely look coldly at all this. This was the moon, after all, not Earth. As we passed each station, the townscape changed accordingly. From a chaotic atmosphere to ordinary streets, the stateless nature of the place became more evident. Buildings both straight and with elegant curves that did not exist in the natural world multiplied as perfectly trimmed trees grew in number. We had entered the White Belt. 
There were many advertisements within the train directed at the typical salary man, with information on insurance for families. Again, the ground gradually lowered and the train slowly separated from it. The beautiful land cityscape unfolded below, and soon we were traveled at a height equal to that of a ten-story building. No matter how beautiful a building was, there would still be provisions for the many complexities in life as one would expect. You know, I never really found buildings that, um, beautiful. <clears throat> I mean, I guess you could say there's some designs and building-wise, you know, that look pretty cool and everything. But I never, there's, I never really considered too many buildings beautiful. I mean, there are some designs out there that look pretty nice, but I don't, I would, hard to call one beautiful, in my opinion. I think calling it beautiful just hmm. maybe I just haven't seen the right building everywhere you looked the green of parks could be seen and one could look down to see large canals in contrast far in the distance one could see the chaotic town of Red Valley I was impressed that they would dare come up with names like White Belt and Red Valley As I thought about that, the train suddenly picked up a burst of speed. Along the streets below, all that could be seen were residential and commercial buildings, like a district of cold buildings. Now that we'd reached a height of 20 stories, we stopped being able to see the tops of buildings passing by. Beyond the window glass, one could see the busy salaryman as electric billboards started to flood the view. Before long, as if the train went right into a thick forest, we were covered in shadows, and vision was reduced greatly for a moment. The train continued to navigate through groups of nearby buildings by going around them, and then suddenly my vision cleared up again. This was the large plaza before the Newton City Central Station. The vastness of the gigantic atrium would amaze not only travelers from Earth, but even those raised on the moon. At 162 meters above ground, nanowires held up a massive clock and hologram screen right in midair. The train continued along the side of the large plaza and was eventually swallowed up within a terminal station. Now, I have mentioned this before, but I think there's some technical issues with this game. Now, if you notice right there, it's like it's trying to switch a picture to another picture, but it's still a blank black screen. I've noticed this as throughout the episodes that we've recorded, so I think there's a technical issue with this game. Either that or it doesn't like my hardware, and to tell you the truth, there really shouldn't be a technical issue with this game. It's not like it's that complicated. I mean, this is not a, you know... A, a super complicated AAA game. Technical issues should be at a minimal because it doesn't require much to run these things. We'll continue. I just thought I'd mention that because as you probably noticed as well, right there is as if it was trying to switch a screen and it was just like a little thing went past. I don't know if it's supposed to do that. Since this is my first time playing through, so maybe someone could write in the comments if you've gotten this far in that if this is how it's supposed to be or not. Alright. The train continued along the side of a large plaza and was eventually swallowed up within the terminal station. It, like Lunar City, can be considered a gathering of the highest levels of wealth and honor for mankind. I got off the train and counted the number of advertisements that came into view. There were three from nanotech companies, four from major software corporations, two from biotech firms, two from insurance companies, and six from banks. And then there were five from investment banks. Each and every one of them was famous for their rate of earnings and prideful of their proceeds. And then they had the task of sweeping up all the proceeds from the wealth on Earth and pumping it into this lunar city. Listing the world's companies in order of market cap, within the top 100 companies, 37 of them were on the moon. It's more than one would find in London or New York. 
The number of companies abandoning Earth and setting up their main office here were great, and the number that wanted to strike it big was even greater. It seems like this might- the moon might be a mixture of the outskirts, you got your poor area, and then the big inner where the rich people live, and where it seems to be quite profitable moving up to the moon it seems like. New frontiers gathered up the brightest of folks. In this area, as long as you had a talented mind and a net connection, you could come out on top. The moon was different from the Earth, where everything the eye could see had been developed owing to a long history, and the old geezer wield immense power sitting high upon their thrones. Some random country couldn't monopolize power here, and because of the nuclear crisis, countries everywhere sh shied away from the bomb. Thus, the moon was literally an empty place with no external annoyances. Even placing second or third in a race to come here would still be more than enough for someone to become a key figure in the city. Though their footprints were no longer displayed along with the others in the Sea of Tranquility Memorial Hall, without a doubt they stood on the forefront of humanity. For example, there was a bronze bust in front of the central entrance of Central City. The model of this overlay serious face statue that seems to look down on pedestrians was E.J. Rochbird, who people said we've simply ended up as an excellent banker had they stayed on Earth. Right now, he was the CEO of a top-class investment bank here on the moon. At merely 29, he got involved in investing in the lunar development train. In those days, he worked vigorously in lunar development, which few people got regarded with much interest as he gambled upon mankind's career and everything he had that got the ball rolling. On Earth, stories were told about how he built the city from nothing. Although many key, key figures would say that very few people understood what that really meant, it's just that they rode the wave well, they said. I supported those sentiments, even though everyone knew that how they all approached it was less than ideal. At any rate, even though my parents came to the moon at the same time that E.J. Rochberg did, it was evident in the difference in income levels. They worked at leveling the rock to put in soil for the growing and harvesting of crops. Was that not a job for trillions of years before? And on that note, it would have been easier to just have done that back on Earth. That was why I made sure to remind myself of this sometimes by coming all the way out to Newton City by train. Particularly, it was a place that those with little training or education would oftentimes find their big break in the city. If you left the station and headed in the opposite direction of the plaza, right before your eyes was the path on the right hand side of the towering building of the lunar government. Among the many glass-built buildings in Newton City, there were many that were built using material cut from dark rock. Because of that, they looked plain at first glance. But in my opinion, it is something that gives off an immediate air, like something with an unequal powerful gravitational pull. That was the financial district where banks and investment banks set up shop. Pointing to the street was a simple sign that said, Schrodinger Street. I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And there, next to it, was a bronze statue of a small cat. A kitty statue! The cat had a sly expression in its eyes. As it lay sprawled with one foot on a single gold plate, engra engraved on the gold plate was this. You can't know the outcome until you open the box. I thought this was most appropriate for the financial district. Although I hadn't succumbed to any religious beliefs here on the moon, I saw nothing wrong with petting the cat for good luck. I put the cat on its head and ran my finger along the outline of the gold plate. You can't know the outcome until you open the box. I came here for the sake of telling myself these words. 
There were many people who went from being mere errand runners to becoming the masters of giant buildings that lined these streets. I literally came to recharge my spirits here. Was he feeling a little in a rut or something? He wanted to recharge his spirits. Schrondiger Street on the weekend was pretty much filled with tourists like me. There were only a few taxis running around, not to mention the total lack of black luxury cars. You could see busy looking people in suits, but the security guards in front of the 5 meter front entrances to buildings were yawning out of boredom. There was a hot dog stand along the road. It was so famous that people ranged from hot shop bankers and traders making a million a month to the six mule an hour mailman would all congregate and eat there. That must be one good hot dog, Sam. I'm not a huge hot dog guy, so... I I can't really remember the best hot dog I've had. I mean... I'm, they're not terrible hot dogs, are, but I just don't know which is the best hot dog I've ever had. Just not really a big hot dog guy. I heard that it was great being able to get your dog 10 seconds after ordering and then eat it with one hand. People who go to the burger joints to eat a meal were considered second rate. And people who'd go buy boxed lunches were just laughing stocks. I don't know. So so apparently this is the joint. You 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 make all this money, you gotta go to the stand out there that sells hot dogs. Don't go to the burger joint downtown. Don't bring your own lunch. You're all losers. This is the place to go. That must be one hell of a hot dog. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. It must be one hell of a hot dog. If the people bring their their own lunches and those who uh, those who go to the burger joint are looked down upon as lesser for their lunch needs. Thus, being caught up in the flow of walking along the street, I bought a hot dog. He wants to look cool. Working on a day off? The vendor said something along those lines and placed a fat sausage in the bun. I didn't even think about replying along the lines of, Don't treat me like a fool. I at least have a stable income. I don't know. Would I? Would you consider yours a stable income? I mean, I would assume that, you know, all your income is investing. It would be up and down. Uh, I mean, it would be dependent on the day. I wouldn't. A, a stable income, I think, would be an income that is consistent. That is like a nine to five type of job where you're working every, you know, each day of the week, and your weeks are always the same. I would consider that more of a stable income. I really don't know if I would consider yours a stable income. Being treated as one of the regulars here filled me with joy. To me, making money was a means and not an end. However, after thinking long and hard about it, the fastest way to get rich had to be here. When I had come to that decision, I felt a great reverence for the people I, at the head of the pack here. And with that, I realized that I actually did have a bit of fanboyism with me. So I think the guy paid my respect to the people passing by and walked off more vigilantly than usual. You know, when he when he shows if he's, if he's gonna show up to the vendor like that, I mean, people, in my opinion, if I saw someone come up like that, I wouldn't think of him as some big stop, big you know, big shot, you know, business dude. I mean, look at him; he looks pretty casual to me. He's wearing shorts, boots. A scarf? He's like the only dude wearing a scarf. Well, I guess there's a good dude with a hoodie in the background there. But, let's see what, let's just continue. The main offices of E.J. Rochberg, with top tier investment banks like Hollard Brothers and Platinum Smith, not far behind, established a massive buildings here. In order to make the most effective use of space, Newen City was divided into three levels. There were the underground level, the above ground level, and the sky level. I was currently in the sky level, 
and the main entrances for all the buildings were here. Below this were related companies and rented out office space. The underground and above ground levels portions of the buildings on Schwerdiger Street were filled with countless funds and consulting agencies. While walking around eating my hot dog, I would occasionally come across narrow and compact buildings with glided signs, gilded signs, and atriums adorned with chandeliers and paintings. These weren't places where money exchanged hands, but rather places where those with enormous sums of money obtained official legal guarantees. Top class law firms, accounting firms, and government outlets resided here. After walking a bit more, I arrived at the intersection in front of me was a strangely shaped edif edifice that reminded me of the Colosseum in Rome. The entrance was dozens of floors above the pavement, and the stairs leading up to it formed its own plaza. I apologize if I pronounced that word wrong. It was such a special place that it was allowed to use up this much space. Occupying the intersection between Schwerdiger Street and Bit Street, which was made up of software and media companies, uh, there's two uffs there, which made up of, of the intersection could be called a city source of wealth. It was a place where stocks from companies all over the world, not just from the moon, were traded. It was the pride of the world. Combined with various future markets, trillions of mules exchanged hands every day. You know what? They talk about mules. Is it just is mules just the moon currency? Or is mules now like a universal currency of the world or something? It kinda sounds like it's moon money, because you know, moon, mules. There were a lot of tourists and a lot of people crowned, crowded around the standard bronze statue at the entrance taking pictures. You could say this was the pinnacle of capitalism and humanity's expansion. The entrance was wedged between giant screens displaying market information 24 hours a day. Currently airing was a discussion between the vice manager of the Lunar Central Bank and the famous CEO of Platina Smith on the relaxation of regulations. Both of them were in their mid-40s and could be considered quite young by Earth's standards. On the moon, someone in their mid-40s would be considered elderly, although these two were still full of confidence and energy. So, Earth, they would be considered quite young, and moon, elderly? And what is the... is there like a, a standard of living slightly lower on the, on the moon or something? Is, is lower? Or is it just um, how the society on Moon has considered certain people? Because if you look at society, different uh, groupings of uh, people, you know, when you become an adult, sometimes it's younger. I mean, if you look at certain cultures, uh, you know, becoming adult is... They're considered an adult before sometimes even, you know actual legal adult, you know, when it's actual on the legal books when the government says they are. So, maybe it's just a cultural thing on the moon. They're considered old, you know, elderly. I wouldn't, to tell you the truth, I personally wouldn't consider someone in their mid-40s elderly. I mean, they're only like, realistically halfway done with their, their life. I mean, I would assume at this far in the future, lifespan probably expanded slightly. So, uh, even for males, I would assume it's probably getting up there to 80-something, 90 years old, almost. Alright. I leaned against the giant steps of the stock exchange and ate the rest of my hot dog slowly. Everything here was big, vast, and solid. Being a little brat not even worth a scrap of tissue... Buying a hot dog was the most that I could do here. However, I used the one computer in my bag to make money, and eventually become one of the major players here. That wasn't much more than the first step in achieving my dream, but attaching specific milestones to my gold made me think of how rash it was. However, there were many people who managed to pull it off in the past. Thus. There shouldn't be any reason I couldn't do it. 
I wouldn't be able to understand without looking with eyes wide open. The CEO of Platinum Smith, who was talking on the screen, had a yearly salary of 70, 37 million moles, being the highest amongst all the major enterprises here in Sh Shirodinger Street. Normal people would be quite satisfied at making 2 million moles over their lifetime, so no one would disagree that this yearly salary man was monstrous. However, there were also many people who made at least a billion moles a year working in these offices. These were hot shots whose salaries definitely had teeth to them, and they made tons of money using their enterprise ex sorry enterprise, I'm at expertise and be behaved almost like lone wolves. These were the people that I looked up to in adoration since I had neither a real educational background nor a financial backer. My ambitions had still not been fulfilled, so I could only watch them here. But eventually I could stand shoulder to shoulder with them and either rivals or comrades, instead of looking at them from a distance. This dude really has some ambitions. He wants to make it big in the corporate world. And make big money. But how is he going to do that? Just stocks? Is he just going to trade stocks? Is that, is that his only plan? Or is he actually going to learn something and try to build something out of the money that he's making? They were unmistakably billionaires, holding on to the majority of the wealth in this world. M money. Just money. The object of my unbearing desire circled here like a whirlpool. Okay, how about we stop it right there? We'll continue with this in uh, part 8. Um, I want to thank you for uh, listening and watching. If you uh, want, feel free to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you again.